deadliest day yet in that ice storm stretching across the south, killing eight people so far. With the travel so dangerous, DoorDash isn't even letting its drivers out on the road. We're live in Tennessee, where the storm's headed now. Plus, a look at a celebration of life for Tyree Nichols. They asked them to please stop, and they did it. And that's why my family will never be the same. An incredibly emotional service calling out the police officers now accused of murdering Nichols and calling on our nation's leaders to do something now about police reform. And with interest rates going up again, President Biden is just sitting down with the House Speaker, who's given us some kind of good vibes in the last couple of minutes about the whole thing. We have more on the political crises, plural, that the president is facing, including new details on the search for classified documents at his beach house. Plus, Brittany Griner hoping to get a new contract locked up today, but that's bringing up some unprecedented questions for the WNBA, considering the concern for Griner's health and safety now. So what's the league going to do? And Beyonce announcing her first new tour in seven years today. So could this be a Taylor Swift 2.0 ticket mess for her renaissance? We're getting into that later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and we're coming on the air tonight with the deadliest day so far from this ice storm sweeping through the South, killing five people, including one student, eight people dead in all. And it is not over yet, even at this point. And you can see why, right? Look at how slick and slippery some of these roads are. That is making travel incredibly dangerous. That is a huge concern at this point. Also partly because of stuff like what you're about to see, right? Down trees in places you wouldn't expect with 23 million people under winter alerts tonight. It is so dangerous on the road. The DoorDash is stopping delivery service in parts of Texas, Arkansas, and Tennessee. And then there are the power outages with more than 340,000 people in the dark. Across the country, you've got, look at this, more than 2,000 flights canceled, nearly 3,000 delayed. Our meteorologist Bill Karens is standing by for where this storm is going next, but I want to get first to Guad Venegas, who is live for us in Memphis, Tennessee. And Guad, you are seeing just how icy these roads can get and just what this storm can do in a region that doesn't see this all that often firsthand. Uh, Hallie, a huge region in the Mid-South has been affected. You know, we saw the images going from Texas to Oklahoma, Arkansas, and here in Tennessee. In fact, this morning, we had planned to go to an area in the city where we could show some of the ice. We couldn't even get there. We decided to stay here in downtown Memphis because this entire area was basically an ice skating rink. Now, I have a sheet of ice. This is how thick the ice is that has been covering the streets. Some of that has broken. They've been treating the streets with salts here in downtown Memphis, but it's still dangerous. There's still ice out there. These are the icicles that are hanging from some of these buildings as the temperature here remains right around the freezing level. You know, it has gotten a little warmer and some of the stuff has melted, but it's still dangerous. Uh, yesterday, we saw rain. We saw sleet. We saw some more rain today. This is here in Tennessee. They got a lot of that in Arkansas and Texas and Oklahoma. And when you have that thickness in the ice, we saw ice as thick as three quarters of an inch. That's the ice that can break branches. Eventually, more ice can break the trees, Hallie. And that's why there was this danger with the power grid and if the trees were going right. to affect uh, that. And uh, we know that as of now, we have this ice storm warning in effect through the night and into tomorrow, Hallie. And that, that was the big question, right, is how this grid is going to hold up when you look at, for example, the state of Texas and when people in this region might catch a break. Well, that's another big question. Correct. So we didn't know what was going to happen. Again, it's the trees. You know, when things freeze, when these trees freeze, the thicker the ice, the easier it is for them to just fall apart. We saw it yesterday in Arkansas. I was walking by some small trees, just tapped one of them and the branches were just falling apart. So the fear was that some of these falling trees could affect the power lines and yeah. then we have issues with the power grid. But as of now, for the most part, that has functioned uh, in Texas. So the power is there. So a couple thousand people did lose power at some point yesterday in Arkansas, but it was a little more than 6,000. So for the most part in the region, the power has been working for the people that are staying at home during the storm, Hallie. Guad Venegas live for us there in Memphis. Guad, thank you. Let's bring in Bill Karens now. Okay, Bill, so give us the 30,000-foot view from the radar here. <laughs> Uh, Austin. It's all about Austin. They've had by far the worst of this ice storm out of Memphis, Little Rock, Dallas, Fort Worth. About 27% of the people in Austin 
don't have power right now. And that's where almost half of the power outages in Texas are located. So that's what the focus is. And thankfully, the temperatures are now warming above freezing in Austin. So a lot of the damage has already been done. And now we'll wait to see how much power they can get back on in the next couple of days. So the additional problems, I'm mostly going to focus north of Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth to Abilene. It's been interesting during the day today. Even though Dallas has been in the 20s with freezing rain for like five or six straight hours, the ice hasn't been accumulating. It hasn't been uh, you know, accruing on the branches or the streets. And that's because the sun's rays, even though it's cloudy, still penetrate through the clouds, the solar radiation. And that's been actually helping them melt things, even though it's in the 20s. That's great. But the sun's about to set, and we still have freezing rain. So you're not out of the woods yet. We still think the Dallas-Fort Worth area is going to get significant ice as we go throughout the overnight hours before it all comes to an end tomorrow. So the areas I'm targeting for the best chance of power outages overnight from Dallas southwards here, just south of Abilene, and also we have to watch out with Little Rock. You still have a chance to get in some freezing rain there. So here's how it all plays out. This is as we go throughout the next couple hours. The orange is the freezing rain. And then tomorrow, it slowly heads out. By about 2 p.m., temperatures are above freezing. The storm is over, and then the big melt just begins. And uh, I say melt is going to melt quickly, too. It is Texas, by the way. By Friday, 50, Saturday, 57. So by the time we get to Friday afternoon, there shouldn't be any ice, uh, ice anywhere, Hallie, left over. Bill, Karen, thank you very much. Appreciate that. We're obviously going to talk again, I know, in the hours to come. I appreciate it. Now that the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates for the eighth meeting in a row, the question now is where do they go from here to fight inflation? In the last couple of hours, Fed Chair Jay Powell is saying, hey, we cannot get complacent here. Watch. Let me, let me, let me put in plain English what Jay Powell basically said, right? Essentially, it was, hey, guess what? More rate hikes are on the way. This one today is a quarter of a percent, which means that rates are now the highest since the number one song in the country was Soldier Boy. I'm sure you remember that that was October 2007. I do. Now, listen, the good news is that this interest rate hike was slower, smaller in part, because inflation has slowed down itself over the last few months. It's still not where the Fed wants all this to be. And this is painting a real picture of where the economy is and, really importantly, where the economy could be going here at this point. This means that any borrowing is going to stay kind of expensive. New mortgages, new car loans, credit cards, private student loans, on top of the stuff that you know is still expensive because of inflation. Stuff like groceries. Watch. I am not paying $4.79 for an apple. Like, y'all have lost your mind. Two of them? Wanna guess how much? 15 bucks. I don't understand how families are gonna keep doing this. Yeah, that's the reality for a lot of people in this country. Brian Chung is joining us now. Stuff is expensive, Brian. I, $4.79 for an apple, that is a lot of money for an apple, right? Like, I feel that. I get that. I think a lot of people do. So Jay Powell is like, okay, well, we're going to continue to probably raise interest hikes, right? How's that going to help all of us? Yeah, did you invoke Soldier Boy, by the way? I don't, I've don't. i never yeah. seen that with the federal. That's phenomenal. I love that. Welcome uh, to this show, friend. <laughs> I think a Timbaland was also t a chop topping <laughs> around that year. But look, well, broadly speaking, what we're talking about, out here is the Federal Reserve continuing to make borrowing costs more expensive. And to your point, that is to try to lower prices. The challenge is when you think about things like food, for example, a lot of that has to do with weather patterns. There's just not that much the Federal Reserve can do. But what they hope to do with their interest rate increases is make things like, for example, mortgages more expensive. Maybe that makes people sideline themselves on the housing market as they have done so far. It's going to make credit card rates remain high, which means less spending on the plastic. These are all things that have, at least so far, had a measurable impact on inflation when you consider that we were pacing price increases at about 9.1 percent in the middle of last year. It's fallen to 6.5 percent as of the last reading, but we're still far away from where the Fed needs to be, which is 2 percent. The Fed has made these interest rate increases smaller. They're going to do likely a few more from here, but they've been able to make those smaller because what they expect is that the bite of the impact of the interest rate increases they've done so far will take a few months to bleed in. They have that off ramp now. Maybe that takes them softly to that two percent target. You know, part of when we talk about the how, when we talk about the economy writ large, we think about the things that affect our budget, like our groceries. I think a lot of people also think of things like their rent or their mortgage, for example. If you want to buy a house, what does this mean? You're talking with a realtor who's not super concerned about that. 
Yeah, well, for what it's worth, the, the numbers on the housing market certainly don't look good when you look at, for example, uh, existing home sales that clocked in about 4 million in the month of December. That's the slowest annualized pace that we've seen in many, many years. But I spoke with one realtor in Atlanta, which, by the way, is a hot market, who mentioned that people still want houses, but there's hesitancy because of these high mortgage rates, which are around 6% right now. Take a listen. Demand has nothing to do with interest rates or anything like that. Demand has to do with household formation. And so that's what they're looking at. Hesitation is what happened, but the demand is still there. People that are capable of purchasing are still there. And here's a measure of the hesitation. At the beginning of last year, around this time last year, she was seeing 32 bids, $85,000 over asking price for houses. As of the end of last year, they were only getting about maybe one or two strong offers. So it shows the hesitation, at least in that market. Sure does. Uh, Brian Chung, I know there is no hesitation from you on the market or on how to do the Soldier Boy, which we will come back to later on in the show. Thank you. So listen, nailed it. Thank you. Uh, what Brian has laid out is really the backdrop, right, for this big meeting today between President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy to basically say, hey, let's talk about the economy. Show me your budget. I'll show you mine. And then the last couple of minutes, we got what I think is fair to characterize as like surprisingly good vibes from Kevin McCarthy about this, saying there's no agreement yet about what these two will do to avoid a financial crisis. But he thinks that both sides will at least keep talking. Watch. I thought this was a good meeting. We promised we would continue the conversation. We'll see if we can get there. I think at the end of the day, we can find common ground. So as this happens, here's the political backdrop to it, right? Not just this, this discussion over what happens on the finances of the country and whether or not we're going to pay our bills, basically, but also the House you're looking at here, new details on the FBI search of the president's Delaware Beach home. They were looking for any misplaced classified documents. It's our understanding the search was pre-planned. There was no warrant. And in the last few hours, we've heard from the president's personal attorney, look at this, saying that, in fact, no classified markings, no documents with classified markings were found in Rehoboth Beach. That's just one of the political battles and investigations the president is facing right now. You see the rest of them on your screen, including investigations into his son, Hunter. And by the way, brand new impeachment articles being filed against his Homeland Security Secretary, Alejandro Mayorkas. Mike Memoli is outside the White House. So, ma'am, we love buckets here. Let's take it in buckets. And let's start with this classified documents issue. The FBI going to search at the president's Rehoboth Beach home is a newsworthy event. That is one thing that is true. Here is something else that is true. It is not exactly similar or the same to the FBI going and executing a search at Mar-a-Lago. Explain the key distinctions here, because there are some, for example, as it relates to subpoenas, et cetera, at least based on what we know so far. Yeah, Hallie, this was an important development to be sure, but not a surprise. One reason we know it wasn't a surprise, we had our cameras there ready because we've been expecting the FBI to search uh, the president's beach house as he has his home in Delaware. And as we just learned yesterday, that they had his office here in Washington, D.C. Once again, the important distinction is that this is being done, as the president's uh, own attorney, Bob Bauer, put it, with the full cooperation of the president, of his aides, of his lawyers. And so that's an important factor here to lay down. But I also think I think it's important to also refer to the key line in that statement, because lawyers are going to lawyer, Hallie. And when they say that no documents with classified markings are found, that's very different from saying that no classified material was found. And it's really important to call back the reporting from our colleague, Carol Lee, which is we know from the search of his Wilmington home as well, there were multiple, and the exact number, obviously, is something we're trying to pin down, but lots of notebooks that have the president's own writings, his own handwritten notes from his time as vice president, there could be classified information in those notebooks. Just because it doesn't have classified markings doesn't mean it's not classified information. And so this is why the continued searches of the president's home, other entities related to him, is important. Because once a special counsel, as we know, Mr. Herr is on the, on the job today uh, fully, it has their sort of teeth in an investigation, it can follow the leads wherever it takes them. And it sometimes leads them in unpredictable directions. So that is one thing that the administration, the White House, the president is dealing with, even as we're getting some new details uh, based on multiple sources, that apparently the general counsel for the National Archives testified to the House Oversight Committee that they were told not to send out a press release about mm -hmm. this, about the archives' role in all this. So that is one thing that is the backdrop of this. Then there's the other sort of piece of this that has developed on Capitol Hill just today in the last 24 hours or so, and that is Republicans really, I think, hitting the gas 
<laughs> starting off what we have long anticipated seeing, which are investigations into the president and the White House and his son, and specifically trying to impeach his Homeland Security Secretary because of their concerns about the border, for example. You have some new reporting on how the White House is trying to play defense here. Well, it's interesting, of course. The White House is keeps insisting that they are going to uh, cooperate with these investigations from Capitol Hill in, when they believe that they are in good faith. Now, that's like an important distinction. There's a the definition of which is going to be subject to interpretation from all sides. Now, one element you list up there is the Hunter Biden investigation. There's uh, some new reporting about some allies of the president and some of uh, the Hunter Biden own legal team recognizing the, the need to maybe raise some more money to pay for his legal defense. Now, I, I want to make a distinction here between the president supporting this effort uh, and the president's allies supporting it, because there may not necessarily be alignment as it relates to both the legal strategy here and the public relations strategy here. Uh, but this is a potentially $10 million legal defense that might need to be mounted, and he's going to need to raise some money to do so. And then super quickly, we talked about this whole discussion over the debt ceiling. Here's why this matters. Please, please don't have your eyeballs glaze over. Here's why this matters. This is basically the open round in what is expected to be a months-long fight between House Republicans, between the White House. And yet here comes Kevin McCarthy out to cameras mm -hmm. in just the last couple of minutes. And I was th kind of like, oh, he's not ticked off. Like, no. he, he's saying things that are not terrible. You know what I mean? Not, not because, he, but because it seems like there was, if not consensus, a path to a consensus here. We got the rhetorical equivalent of Brian's excellent soldier boy here. I mean, this was a surprise in the, my, the my, positive no, we tenor. Did not. We sure didn't. <laughs> don't, that's a stretch. All right. Well, don't ask me to dance. But re regardless, it was notable to hear Speaker McCarthy rather optimistic. He even suggested, Hallie, that they might be able to agree to a two year budget deal. Now, that's something we haven't seen in quite a long time. Yeah. This first meeting, Hallie, is all about posturing. The president's been clear about challenging Republicans to put some details on the table. Gotcha. And I think Speaker McCarthy wants to set the tone by saying, hey, I think we can get to a deal here. Long way to go. Mike, Mike Memley live for us outside the White House. Mem, thank you. Appreciate it. We want to take you live to Memphis now with an emotional and difficult and poignant scene there late today where people who knew and loved Tyree Nichols joined with those who are fighting for justice for him after his death. To remember the life he lived, to remember not the body cam video of the horrific beating at the hands of police, but images like the ones you're about to see. Nichols, a son and father, and as he was described today, a beautiful soul gone too soon. Family members describing how losing him felt like a nightmare. I lost my faith. I cried. I screamed at God, asking how could he let this happen? Tyree was a beautiful person. And for this to happen to him, it's just unimaginable. We cannot continue to let these people brutalize our kids. So yes, this was a moment to celebrate Nichols' life, but also a moment for a call to action. With Vice President Kamala Harris in attendance, she promised that the White House will do whatever it takes, whatever it can do, as you see her there hugging Nichols' family, to try to stop this kind of thing from happening again. We demand that Congress pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Joe Biden will sign it. It is non-negotiable. This funeral coming three weeks after Nichols' death and just a few days after some of the footage from that encounter were released to the public with demonstrations coast to coast, again calling for accountability. Antonia Hilton is joining us now. Antonia, tell us what it has been like to be there. It's been a really emotional day for many here, Hallie, as people have been waiting for this moment to all gather to celebrate his life, you know, for weeks now. And it was an interesting ceremony because it blended a celebration of his life. You got to hear so many tender moments, things we hadn't heard about Tyree before, very simple memories, you know, talk, people talking about babysitting him, the snacks he liked to eat, him watching Looney Tunes on TV as a kid very sort of simple details about his life, but a reminder of just how universal this is and how often as these stories grow and they become national and it becomes all about the horrible way in which the person died, that actually there's so much about their life, just these little regular moments that can become so easy to forget and, and so drowned out by the rest of what's happening here. And so the ceremony made a point of touching on so much of who he was as a beloved person to all the people here today. But 
you know, as all black churches, historic black churches, particularly in places like Memphis do, they always give you a message. There is always mm -hmm. a call to action. And it was no different here today. Everyone who spoke, spoke about the need for Tyree to not die in vain and how the next step has to look like either legislative action, uh, community action here, and how they're going to turn this moment into a push. Take a listen to some of what was said at the funeral. Why do you have the same department that can keep crime down on one side of town without beating folk to death, but you can't do it on the other side of town? And every time you kill one of us on video, we're going to say the legacy of Tyree Nichols is that we have equal justice swiftly. And Tally, one of the moments where people were on their feet and cheering today was when Senator, uh, or excuse me, Vice President Harris came forward and she spoke powerfully and said that the Biden administration was committed to doing everything that they could to get the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act passed. People were cheering and clapping for that moment. And that's a good example of what the community is looking for now after his death. There was another moment that um, I thought was was noteworthy here when we heard from the family of Tyree Nichols and you heard um, one of the family members talk about the lies and deceit after Nichols' death that they didn't know, right? Because their, their truth wasn't told in those moments after his horrific beating at the hands of these police officers until days later here. And that is part of what has, I think, raised so many questions here about the police transparency. Why was that initial news release so contradictory to what the footage later showed, et cetera? We have been hearing that perhaps more charges may come, that perhaps more people may be charged. What is the status of the investigation on that? Hallie, every day it seems we find out more about the next stages mm -hmm. of all of this. NBC News has received the administrative files, the records on these five officers, and found that four of them had pretty extensive histories of infractions in the department that range from failing to uh, file paperwork properly uh, to use of force incidents to even one very ironic incident of one of the five officers recklessly driving during a call one night and causing a three a car crash. I mean, it's the kind of stuff you can't make up because when you remember that this entire story begins with an accusation that Tyree Nichols did reckless driving, even mm -hmm. though we don't have evidence of that, hearing that an officer involved engaged in that himself, it raises questions about the department, what people knew or did not know, and why these officers maybe weren't facing any kind of accountability ahead of this, you know, if this could have been preventable. Right. Those are the questions we're hearing now on the ground, Allie. Antonia Hilton, uh, thank you for being there for us on the ground after what I know has been a long and difficult day. Appreciate it. Breaking, just as we've been on the air tonight, NBC News has learned that the FBI is now speaking with a Navy veteran connected to Republican Congressman George Santos. This guy says that Santos basically pocketed 3,000 bucks that was in a GoFundMe account meant for surgery for his dying service dog. The veteran says he has given the FBI everything he has, including texts with Congressman Santos. A spokesperson for the FBI in New York declined to comment. Santos, by the way, has denied the allegations. Joining me now is Ali Vitale. And Ali, I fear that I have said, I think, all of the facts that we know, right? Like, that <laughs> yeah. is what we know at this point, not much more beyond that. But what is interesting here is that we appear to be confirming FBI involvement at all. If this turns out to be true and what this Navy veteran yeah. is telling us is accurate, that the FBI has reached out to him at all, it's kind of interesting. It's pretty interesting, and it's another legal entanglement. This goes beyond just lies about where he went to college, lies about who he worked with and where. This is actually at the heart of, was something illegal afoot here? We knew that there were questions about what was going on within his campaign finances. Now, these are a different set of finances through the GoFundMe account and this Navy veteran, but nevertheless, the FBI is now another entity that we can probably add to the list that's probing George Santos. Now, again, this does not mean he has done anything wrong, but certainly it means that people are looking into whether he's done anything wrong in this and all of those other regards. Our producer, who's been stationed outside there all day, did ask him about this. He didn't answer any of those questions. He hasn't really been very responsive to much of anything today outside of his office. But nevertheless, it comes against the backdrop of Santos stepping off committees while he says all of the dust around him sort of settles but also saying that he's not going to resign from Congress, even as we saw polling out of his district that said a lot of people there, Republicans and Democrats alike, do not want him serving and representing them.
Ali Vitali live for us on the Hill. Ali, thank you very much. Coming up here on the show, the GOAT says he is gone for good. How the football world is reacting to this year's Tom Brady retirement. Plus, some good news on that missing radioactive pellet in Australia. We'll tell you where officials say they found it. The actual radioactive needle in a haystack, they got it. We'll tell you where in our five things. A year to the day after Tom Brady said he would retire, Tom Brady today says he is retiring. The legendary NFL quarterback announcing on social media he's walking away for good this time and that he wouldn't change a thing. I uh, won't be long-winded. I think you only get one super emotional retirement essay, and I used mine up last year. Thank you guys for allowing me to live my absolute dream. Lots of reaction from the football world today. Former teammates and opponents posting pics, posting comments, everything from, like, congratulations to simply the goat emoji. As you know, goat, greatest of all times. And a lot of people think he is the goat, right? Seven Super Bowl wins in 23 years. He was the MVP in five of them. One very notable Super Bowl loss to the Philadelphia Eagles, in case you forgot. He had three league MVPs, was the all-time leader in passing yards and touchdowns for both the regular season and the playoffs. Sam Brock is following this from Miami. I am not too small of a person to note that Tom Brady lost to the Eagles. Let me just throw that out there. He's still obviously a good player, but is this for real? Like he said last time was real also, and then he didn't. He's sort of unretired here. Like, should we, should we buy that this is it for him? Hold on. Are you an Eagles fan? Is that why you brought that up? Not All he right. lost twice to the New York Giants. You know, it depends really what your, your perspective is on this. But, Hallie, Great I'm point. also wondering, like, what are point. we going to talk about now that Tom Brady is retiring? I'm really, like, I'm just trying to figure this out. <laughs> I will say this, Hallie, you know, in terms of what does this mean moving forward for Tom Brady? Is it for real? It would be pretty hard to argue that it is not. Because what are his pathways to another championship? He's with the Bucks. They barely right. made the playoffs last night. And we know he's looking for another ring. Does he go to San Francisco that already has a young quarterback now in Brock Purdy? Miami, where I am, they said they're sticking with Tua. There's not a team out there you can kind of just drop Brady in and instant formula he's ready to go to the Super Bowl I think that's part of this and part of it too is he's 45 years old he started last season as the oldest player in the NFL that was last year and eventually I don't care how amazing the magical elixir is that you're using to become active at 45 <laughs> playing like you're 25 but eventually father time does catch up with you the ravages of time will make us all grotesque eventually. But the point is, we're, we're going to see Tom Brady again. He literally has a movie about him coming out tomorrow starring, like, very famous people. He's probably going to end up in the broadcast booth, right? Like, isn't he going to be a Tony Romo-esque kind of announcer? Yeah, you could definitely see him being an incredibly insightful and successful broadcaster. He does have a 10-year, $375 million contract already lined up with Fox Sports. So, yes, that is most definitely in the cards. In terms of some of his other ventures, Hallie, he has a health and wellness business. You talked about the film industry, 80 for Brady. I would really love to know who the target audience is for that movie. But, yes, that is also a subject matter focusing on Tom Brady. He's going to be <laughs> plenty busy, but I, a lot of folks really are just going to miss the fact that yeah. this guy who has done things we had never seen before Hallie he won three Super Bowls in his 20s two in his 30s two in his 40s each decade was a Hall of Fame career for this guy there is no one else in professional sports that you can think of off the top of your head that has a resume like that well when you put it like that Sam Brock thank you very much I can't tell if we're gonna get hate mail from Brady lovers or, or fan mail thank you Speaking of sports, let's stick with it because Brittany Griner's return to the WNBA this summer could create an unprecedented new question for the league, one that they haven't had to address before. Because remember, Griner is a free agent. She said she's going to go back to the Phoenix Mercury. She couldn't sign a contract today. But after spending nearly 10 months behind bars in Russia and returning to the U.S. in a dramatic prisoner swap, with the U.S. saying she was wrongfully detained, getting Griner to and from road games brings up some safety concerns. There are some who say Griner may need some special travel accommodations, like maybe chartered flights. OK, well, the WNBA does not let individual teams charter flights. Everybody's required to fly commercial. Any change in that would have to be approved by both the union and the league. Kathy Park is joining us now. And, and Kathy, the number one thing, right, has got to be, you, you think, the safety of Brittany Griner here. The issue of charter travel for the WNBA has been a problem for a while, right? Talk us through the dynamics here and the way that the league is going to have to grapple with these questions. 
Yeah, so it has been a pain point for the WNBA for quite some time, but obviously with Brittany Griner in the picture now, this has changed the conversation. Safety is going to be top of mind, and the WNBA commissioner as well as a leadership with the Phoenix Mercury, if she is officially going to be joining that team later on this summer, they say they are already talking to security experts to ensure her safety. But Hallie, as you mentioned, all of the players with the WNBA, they are required to fly commercial only. And if they do have to charter these flights, they have to get the approval from the league as well as the union. And if they break these protocols, they could be looking at a pretty hefty fine. But Brianna Stewart, uh, she has been pretty active on social media. She's perhaps one of the, the most visible and high profile players with the WNBA free class uh, this year. And she said, look, she's willing to offer up her NIL money to charter these these flights and it's getting some traction from current players with the WNBA as well mm. as former players so we'll see uh, if that is something that they uh, they move forward with so listen the WNBA is a very different sized league than let's say the NFL right very different sized businesses we're gonna put up the, the revenue that each made back in 2021 but if you look here the the NFL the NBA Major League Baseball which all get in obviously a ton of money they all charter flights except in a few cases where team owners have their own private jets right like this this feels like and again the WNBA doesn't make as much money but this does feel like another issue of mm -hmm. um, things are just not the same right like things are just not the same in this women's league as it is in these men's leagues. Yeah, when you, when you put all those numbers together, Hallie, you're, you're comparing billions versus millions right. in revenue for the WNBA. And it, when, when you look at these the charter situation, the WNBA commissioner said, look, um, they can't move forward with chartering flights because it's going to cost roughly $25 million um, if they charter these, these players across all 12 teams. However, she is open to discussion. She said, look, if businesses are willing to pay up, she's all yours. Kathy Park, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the UK. Seeing its biggest strike in more than a decade today. We're talking hundreds of thousands of people who walked out over pay and pensions. Teachers, train conductors, airport staffers, first responders. And this is not the end of it. There's more strikes to come. Number two, officials in Australia, are you ready for this? They say they've found that radioactive needle in a haystack, that little tiny radioactive pellet you see it there that went missing in the outback. The search area was 870 miles long. That's like the length of California. This team driving with special radiation detection equipment discovered it outside a mining town and officials say it is all contained now. Hey man, good for them, they did it. Number three, former South Carolina governor and former UN ambassador Nikki Haley. The expectation is she will announce a presidential push later this month, according to sources familiar. Haley is sending invites out for a special event on February 15th. If this happens, it would make her former President Trump's first official GOP primary opponent. Unless, of course, anybody jumps the gun on her on that. Number four, people in New York City are going to have to start asking for plastic forks and spoons when they get stuff delivered. That's because Mayor Eric Adams signed a bill today that would ban plastic utensils, extra napkins, extra containers, unless people specifically say they want them. Officials say this is a necessary step toward a cleaner, greener city goes into effect this summer. Number five, a green comet is flying by Earth, and tonight you may be able to see it with your own eyeballs, sans telescope. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to spot the comet, which is what scientists say. It's going to look like a little faint, fuzzy glow. You will need to be, like, away from bright lights in big cities, so go out into the woods and bust out some binocs tonight. When we come back, the College Board has stripped down its new AP African American Studies class, cutting out things that Florida's governor had a problem with. What's out and what the nonprofit's saying about why it's changing course on this course. Next. The curriculum for an AP African American Studies course has been changed after Florida Governor Ron DeSantis banned the class because he says it had left wing bias. Well, the College Board is now out with the official curriculum today, and there are big changes to sections of the syllabus that were criticized by the DeSantis administration. For example, they've removed the names of several black authors, they've removed topics like Black Lives Matter and Black Struggle in the 21st Century. They added a topic called Black Conservatism. Ron Allen is joining us now. And Ron, the college, listen, the college board said it wasn't going to give in to political pressure. They're saying that these, were, these changes were going to happen before DeSantis stepped in to criticize them. Help us understand, like, what is the college board saying about its rationale to make these changes that align with what DeSantis and the governor's administration wanted to see? 
Well, welcome to Black Heritage Month and the latest chapter in the nation's culture wars. That's why all this is happening today, to some extent. The College Board is saying that this is a process that's been going on for a number of years, and that's true. And the final version is not going to be in classrooms across the country for another year or so. It's going to get rolled out more widely now, what they are producing, this framework. And what they are saying is that this is the result of consultations with hundreds of African-American history experts. Uh, there are critics. Uh, there was an open letter on Medium that was by hundreds of African-American experts criticizing the proposal and, Flor and the Florida governor for his role in changing this. <clears throat> so. It's a very emotional subject. Basically, the College Board is saying that they are focusing this curriculum on what they call core topics, uh, not and, and primary sources, not secondary sources and issues and contemporary topics, which is some of the the academic jargon to try and say that they're trying to focus on the basics and not these contemporary flashpoint issues. You know, you talk about several authors who are now not required reading. Uh, they are authors who write about things like critical race theory, which we've heard so much about in recent days, about reparations movement, about Black Lives Matter, about contemporary issues. And, and as you pointed out, yes, there is now a, a nod to conservative black conservative thinking, and these are people who are against things like affirmative action and, and are for uh, self-reliance and against government-sponsored programs, support programs, safety net programs, and so forth. So this whole issue of African-American studies is now firmly in the center of the country's political debate, and of course all yeah. this more so because DeSantis is expected to run for president. Of course, that's why he is so much in the spotlight sort of politically and in this moment. It's also possible that even with these changes, the Florida Department of Education could still decide not to allow this course to be offered, right? Like that is still a possibility on the table? In Florida, yes. But remember, this is right. a national course so that right. there are uh, school boards and uh, superintendents of schools across the country who are, are looking at this and who will assess it and who will refine it. It will no doubt be taught differently in Florida and Texas than in California and New York whenever it is uh, the final product. And just, you know, again, this is important because this is a course that a lot of students take uh, and, and an exam that they take that gives them college credit, that gets them into some colleges. And this is the first time that the College Board, this nonprofit that's sort of the the, the big arbiter of all these things across the country, is offering an African-American studies course for advanced placement. There are several dozen other courses across the sciences and arts, and there's a European history course, yeah. but not an African-American histories course. And, of course, again, the bottom line is that this is, this is putting this firmly in the center of the country's debate about this racial reckoning that we're going through, about issues of race. To simplify it, there's one group, or conservatives, or folks on one side, who think history should only be about the basics, names, dates, places, events, and others who think it should be more progressive, more forward-thinking about contemporary issues, what's going on in the country. And that's where you start getting into problems of, of what should be taught uh, and, and how and by whom. Ron Allen, that's a great breakdown of this. Thank you so much for your reporting and for being here with us on the show. Thanks. Over on Capitol Hill today, lawmakers are targeting all that COVID relief money that they say has resulted in fraud and a lot of money lost. Money, by the way, that is your money. It's your taxpayer dollars that ended up going to stuff that just wasn't legit, basically. But when lawmakers try to get to the bottom of, like, how much of your money was spent fraudulently, they don't really know. They weren't able to get to it. Watch. It will be a while before the full extent of fraud is known. It's clearly in the tens of billions of dollars. The, it wouldn't surprise me if it exceeds ultimately more than $100 billion. That's a bananas amount of money, right? Earlier this week, we found out that the government gave out at least $5 billion in potentially fraudulent loans related to the pandemic, attached to nearly 70,000 questionable Social Security numbers. That's only one part of this. Tom Casella joins us now with more of this. And Tom, this was interesting today because we heard from witnesses, including one who said basically some of the warning signs were there. Yeah. By the way, he was being conservative. Uh, the real estimate is $500 billion. It's a staggering lost amount of money. Out of $5 trillion that was allocated for all of these pandemic relief monies, also right? A tremendous or funds. amount of money, yeah, yeah. Tremendous amount of money. And you're right, it is your money, it is my money. This is money that was going essentially, reminders to the audience, to make sure that there was food on the table for families, right. that they didn't lose their jobs, they didn't lose their homes, businesses stayed open, all of that. And yet there was 
virtually no to very little oversight. And listen, this is not really debatable. Most of the government experts, the GAO, the Inspector General, they all acknowledge there was very little oversight because the emphasis was push the money out as fast as you can so we can save the country from essentially imploding, right? That was the fear. This was like an emergency situation, and they were like, go, exactly. just do it. You got to exactly. help people, right? But now we're paying the price because if you're looking at the, the amount of money that is, <laughs> here's the thing, gone to Russian crime syndicates, mm. Chinese state crime syndicates, Nigerian crime syndicates, not to mention, uh, you know, people who were already worth several million dollars here in the States stealing money that was meant to go to keep businesses alive, literally buying an island in the Gulf of Mexico with that money. One guy was just convicted of that. I mean, the, the, the fraud is astonishing on all levels. And unfortunately, the chances you and I are going to get the money back is very, very, very low, I should say. There are some lawmakers who are trying to say that this is sort of political, too. Yeah. Like, for example, the House Oversight Committee chair, Republican uh, James Comer. Here's what he said. We must identify where this money went, how much ended up in the hands of fraudsters or ineligible participants, and what should be done to ensure that it never happens again. He calls it the greatest theft of American taxpayer dollars. It does, you know, you give us a sense, but it does seem like there is a bipartisan push to get to the bottom of this, because the point is not, as you said, we're probably not going to recoup that money. Right. But for the next emergency, right? For the next time, how can they prevent it? Yeah, well, God forbid we have another one, but you're right. Well, Here's right, the thing. Right. There, is, there is very little, if any, uh, disagreement over the fact that this is a phenomenal amount of money that was lost. The Republicans blame, blame the Democrats, who were in charge of Congress at the time, saying they didn't provide the oversight. Democrats blame the, blame the Republicans, especially Trump, who apparently told his, his specific offices uh, within his administration don't cooperate with Congress. Congress on providing details mm. on where all the information, all the money is going. We're going to curtail the data flow. So there's plenty of blame going back and forth. I'm not sure the people at home care. I think most people at home say, just don't do it again and get the money back. Can they do and that? Put in, and can put they in do it not again? Uh, you know what I mean? like, can they put in processes that avoid making this happen again? That's what the entire emphasis is on. And I think you've got two independent witnesses today who are very credible and very good, who said, we have warned about this for years. Yeah. Now is the time put into place, into place, the, the steps to make sure we don't go through this again. Tom Costello, you are always on that accountability beat. Thank you. you Appreciate bet. you being with us. Coming up here on the show, more questions and a bigger reward for info on whatever's going on at the Dallas Zoo. But there is some good news. Those missing monkeys we told you about, they're found. We'll tell you more about what we're hearing from the zoo tonight. Plus, new video showing how far a canine cop would go to save his partner. Where do you see it? That's next in the local. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Western Bureau, just coming into us not too long ago, police in Oregon have announced a man wanted for torturing and kidnapping a woman has died after a standoff last night. The woman he's accused of attacking is still reported to be in critical condition. Officials said today they're also linking the man to two murders. This is the person who they believed was using dating apps even after all this. From our DC Bureau, one person is dead, three others hurt after somebody shot at people, seemingly at random, on a public bus and at a metro station in Washington today. Passengers tackled the suspected shooter on a train. He is now in custody. From our Southeast Bureau, check out this video. It shows a Texas canine officer braving a tornado last week to save his partner. So here's the deal. The dog was apparently inside the car in a kennel. Look at this. When the storm started picking up, the officer runs out, grabs him. There's like wind, debris all over. He told our Houston affiliate he couldn't see anything when he did this, but there was no way he was going to leave family behind. That's what he called him. Do not leave family behind. That is just scary and incredible and amazing that both he and the dog were okay. Speaking of animals that are okay, you know those two emperor tamarind monkeys that went missing from the Dallas Zoo? They are back, safe at home at the zoo. So, like, great. Here's what's maybe not so great. Tons of questions about what happened to them. Truck them up. Well, Bella and Finn, here they are in this picture. The Dallas Zoo did a health exam and says, even though they lost a little bit of weight, they're both in good shape. They're eating and drinking normally. 
How did they find him? Well, they got a tip. So police went and looked into this abandoned home just south of Dallas where they found the animals actually right as we were on the air last night. We didn't know that was happening when we were talking with Morgan Chesky, but the police department shared this picture showing one of the monkeys inside a closet perched on what looks like a section of a chain link fence. Morgan Chesky is joining us now. And so like, great, we talked last night, like who, unbeknownst to us, as you and I were having this conversation on the air, police were like going and finding Bella and Finn. All these questions, though, about how do they even get out in the first place, right? What else do we know? Yeah, this mystery is only halfway solved, right, right. Allie? The call went out that the monkeys were missing. The tipster made the phone call in. Really, all they gave police was that home address south of Dallas where they found an abandoned dwelling with the monkeys in the closet. So, as you mentioned, aside from losing a little weight, both Bella and Finn appearing to be okay. But the detective that I, or the spokesman with the police department I spoke to last night said that detectives are absolutely looking ahead and they have this photo that they've released of a man seen at the zoo on Sunday. They're not calling him a suspect. They're not even calling him a person of interest. But they do want to speak to that man and ask him questions about the disappearance of Finn and Bella. And that's really all police are saying at this time. They did credit the public, that tipster, for calling them. And really, they're hoping by releasing that picture, someone else in the public may be able to connect them to yeah. that individual in hopes of closing this case on at least this incident that's happened at the zoo involving the two monkeys. Allie? Well, you say this incident because there have been other incidents as well, right, with enclosures that have been cut, yeah. et cetera. Um, you know, this is national news. Like, what's happening on the Dallas, the Dallas Zoo is national news. Is there a sense that, like, things are going to be more chill at the zoo? Are they concerned about the safety and security of other animals there now? They absolutely are. Short answer. What's been interesting in speaking with zoo officials is that they've ratcheted up security every time something has happened. Going back to January 13th when Nova the Clouded Leopard originally went missing, it was fortunately returned. That enclosure was found to have had a cut placed in it along with several other enclosures. Then you go to January 21st and you have their endangered vulture pin that was discovered dead that had lived at the zoo in harmony for more than three decades. So you can imagine the frustration and the trauma zoo staff is going through regarding these incidents, Allie. As for whether or not anything will happen again, they're going to have to do everything they can, more cameras, more foot patrols, uh, and, and hopefully more eyes for the public to try to track down the person responsible here behind this uh, disappearance of these two monkeys. That is for sure. Morgan Chesky live for us there in Dallas. Morgan, great to see you. Thank you. Still to come here on the show, Beyonce, have you heard, going on her first solo tour in years. But trying to get those tickets, people are worried, might it break your soul, their soul, the souls of some of our staffers on this show, just like Taylor Swift. We'll talk about what we know about this next potential ticketing issue, maybe after a break. Ozzy Osbourne announcing today he is retiring from road shows altogether. The Grammy winner and founding member of Black Sabbath says he can sing just fine, but pain from a spinal injury has made him physically weak. That's how he describes it. He also shares, I know I couldn't deal with the travel required. Never would I have imagined that my touring days would have ended this way. That rock and roll lifestyle wasn't always easy on Osborne. His struggle with substance abuse has been well documented. And in 2020, he shared he'd been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Still, Osborne says he's brainstorming ways he can keep performing without the travel, which is good news for his very loyal fans. There is another music icon who is making a lot of headlines today because it is official as of today. Queen B, she is getting back on the road. She is back. She's going to tour. Putting this picture up on Instagram saying simply Renaissance World Tour 2023. This is the first time we're going to see Beyonce on the road since 2016. And it's all happening just a couple of days before the Grammys where she is the most nominated artist this year with that Renaissance album. Just a couple weeks ago, Beyonce performed her first concert in more than four years at the opening of a luxury resort, resort in Dubai. You probably heard about it. It probably ended up on your For You page because critics were not happy about it given Dubai's serious human rights violations. But for the fans, there's a big question on their minds, right? Given this tour now, how are you going to get tickets? Is this going to be another Taylor Swift era's tour ticket debacle? Ticketmaster's website says Beyonce is using the same verified fan system that Swift used but Ticketmaster says there is a, I'm quoting them, 
quote, less crowded ticket shopping experience. Is it gonna work for Beyonce fans? Jem Oswat has all of the answers, including the answer to that question, Jem, right? I mean, nobody really knows, but like, that is a real concern here. People are looking at what just happened with Taylor Swift. They're looking at Beyonce, who is a mega, mega, super, superstar. Are people gonna be able to get the tickets they want? Well, not everybody, because, you know, what you're probably talking about is a similar situation to what happened with Taylor Swift in that you've got 10, 100 times more people trying to buy tickets than ticket, than there actually are tickets. The difference here is Live Nation Ticketmaster is rolling it out in three installments. The um, problem... <laughs> The biggest problem with the Taylor Swift on sale is that they just put too many tickets out into the market at once. Mm. And uh, it, along with breaking records, because they did sell a record two million tickets in one day, they also broke the internet. So um, that was uh, that was a problem that I'm sure they've learned from. And, uh, you know, Live Nation is... Uh, is aware that their reputation rides on this. Mm. So I would be surprised that there are going to be problems. I would be very surprised if there were a problem on the scale of Taylor Swift. That is, I'm sure, music, no pun intended, to a lot of people's ears here. Um, we talked about that Dubai performance, which got some backlash. She was also defended by her fans, some of them for that. W w anything from her camp on that? I mean, is this, she's just going to kind of move past it, right? No, she... I, yeah, I mean, word was she got paid $24 million, which I guess was uh, considered sufficient to overlook those things. Um, you know, it, I'm reluctant to say a little bit more about it because, yeah, her fans are quite aggressive <laughs> online, as I've found out in the past. But one thing that uh, is notable is the fact that as elaborate as the show was, there was a lake, there was an, an all-female orchestra. It ended with fireworks and her, like, rising on this platform, like, 50 feet into the air. Uh, she didn't play any songs from Renaissance. So Might she... Oh, I'm sorry, I was going to say, might she do that perhaps at the Grammys? You are in California prepping for the Grammys. You think we'll see her perform at all, roll out any of those songs? Uh, we're still not sure, but uh, if she does perform, it's almost guaranteed she's going to play a Renaissance song. And I mean, that's what I was going to say. She'll either premiere the song on the Grammys, which it seems to be that would be a logical next step in this in this rollout um or she's saving him for the tour and also don't forget there's two more parts to renaissance there because right. the album that came out last summer was just part one there's still a part two and part three we're not sure what any of them are you know i mean they're being very cryptic about it uh but it could be another album it could be the tour it could be i'm thinking most likely at least one element is going to be a long form video treatment of some kind. I wouldn't be surprised if it were almost a feature length film. Jem Aswa. Jem, thank you very much for all the Beyonce intel. Appreciate it. That does it for us this hour. We're going to have more for you here tomorrow, same time, same place. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.